This sermon was recorded at the Church of Christ, Northwest Arkansas. We are Christians seeking to worship God in spirit and in truth, according to the New Testament. Come worship with us Sunday mornings at 1030 at 1708 Elm Springs Road in Springdale, Arkansas. My prayer that this morning that the things we study will first and foremost be in strict accordance to God's Word. And secondly, it will be useful to you and it will be beneficial as you continue your Christian walk. So for a little while this morning, I want to talk about the Lord's Church. When you think about the word church or the word translated as church, it, it can be different things throughout the Bible. Sometimes it speaks of a local gathering of congregations or uh, saints in a local congregation. And sometimes it's referring to a bigger picture, the universal body of saints all throughout the world. So we're going to study a little bit about that this morning. An example of this is in Matthew chapter 16, verse 18 and 19. Matthew 16, beginning in 18, it says, And I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So this is where Jesus had promised to build his church, and he was talking to Peter at the time, and he had promised to build his church. He also refers to it as the kingdom of heaven. So we can see it's this bigger picture uh, instead of just a local congregation at this time. There's other instances, like in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 22, it says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him, talking about Jesus, to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. So this is where we learn that Christ is the head of the church, and the church is also called his body. And it's singular, so it's, it's one body that we see. So when Bible talks about the church, most of the time it's referring to this universal body of Christians regardless of the physical location. So it doesn't matter what congregation you're a part of, you're a member of the whole church as, as we see it. So for a little while this morning, I want to look at the church that Christ built and why it's important for us today. So the first thing that we see when Christ looks at His church is He desires that the church would be unified. In John chapter 17, verse 20, Jesus says, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also which shall believe on me through their word that they may all be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee, that they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. So Jesus prayed that we would all be one, just as he is one in the Father, that we would all be one together. So he wanted us to be unified. And there's a couple of different things that we can look at. In Colossians chapter 1 and verse 18, it says, He is the head of the body, the church, who is the beginning of the firstborn from the dead, that all things he might have the preeminence. This is where the Bible speaks of the church as the body, and it's described in a singular term. So he's the head of the body. So he wants us to all be unified as the body of Christ. The other thing is it's one bride. The church is one bride of Christ. In 2 Corinthians 11, verse 2, it says, For I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you unto one husband that I might present you as a chaste virgin to Christ. This is Paul writing to the church of Corinth, and he's telling them that they are one bride to Christ as their husband. And then we have another verse in Ephesians chapter 5, and verse 23. It says, For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, and he's the Savior of the body. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be to their own husbands in everything. So this is where Paul is writing to the church of Ephesus, and he's comparing the relationship that we have as the church to Christ that's the same kind of relationship as a wife to her husband. So we can see the unity that we have is it's one body, and it's in one bride to Christ. And that's the body that we have is the church. With this unity comes a standard. We should all be, have the same standard that we follow. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, beginning in verse 10, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that ye speak the same thing, and that there will be no divisions among you, but that ye be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Now this I say, that every one of you saith, I am of Paul, and I of Apollos, and I of Cephas, and I of Christ. Is Christ divided? Was Paul crucified for you, or were you baptized in the name of Paul? 
Paul's writing to the church of Corinth here, and he's telling them the same thing that he would be telling us today, that we should have the same mind, the same judgment, and that we should be unified on the same standard. And he goes on and talks about in verse 12 that he hears that some of them, are, they have contentions, they have disagreements among them. So some were saying, like, well, I follow Paul, and some say, I follow Cephas, and some say, I follow Apollos. And Paul's chastising them here, and he's saying, you shouldn't do that. You, shouldn't, you should all just follow Christ. Christ is our standard. And Christ is what we should always go after. So we must have one mind and one standard as the church. And that standard is God's Word. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, it says, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. So the Bible is our all-sufficient standard that we need in order to follow after what God wants us. This is the standard that we should be unified on. It's the Word of God. And Jesus challenged us in Luke chapter 6 to make sure we're actually following after that. Luke chapter 6, verse 46, Jesus says, And why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? You know, it's a little bit silly for us to call Jesus our Lord and our Savior and everything that we follow if we don't do what He asks us to do. So Jesus is challenging us to keep God and His Word as our standard and to follow after the things that He has taught us. We also have to make sure that we're not following after man, that we truly are following after God's will. Matthew chapter 15 and verse 8, it says, The people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain they do worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. So Jesus is telling us here that it, we can draw nigh to Him with our mouth and our lips, but if our heart's not in it, if we're really not following after God, then that worship is in vain. And that word vain means empty, means pointless. It does no profit. It doesn't help you any. So if we really want to follow after God and really do what He says, we do it as He says to do it, not after man's commandments or anything that man would tell us to do. Also in Titus chapter 1, verse 14, it says, "...not giving heed to Jewish fables." and to commandments of men that turn from the truth. We have to be aware that if we follow after man's commandments and man's traditions and it doesn't line up with what the Word of God says, then that will turn us from the truth. Just as Paul is writing to Titus here. It's a good warning for us to make sure that we truly follow after God's Word and that our heart is in it. And that is the standard that we follow. Another thing we're going to look at with the church is the name. What should the name of the church be? Ephesians chapter 3, verse 14, it says, For this cause I bow my knees unto the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, of whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So Paul's telling us here that the whole family of Christ, the body of Christ, the bride of Christ, it's named after the Lord Jesus Christ. So our name needs to be after Christ. So if we look at that, we have a couple of verses where we can see that, that this happens. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 2, Paul writes and says, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. So Paul writing to the church of Corinth, he calls it the church of God, which is at Corinth. Well, the church of God can also be the same thing as the church of Christ because we know Christ is God. We know the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit is God. So Christ is God, so it's just like he's saying to the church of Christ. So it is named after Christ if, if it's called the church of God. Another example that we have is Romans chapter 16 and verse 16 where it says, Salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. This is where Paul is referring to the different congregations that are spread around the regions, and he's calling those churches. And he re relates those as the churches of Christ. So there's a name once again that the name is after Christ. Then the third example that we'll have is Hebrews chapter 12, verse 23. It says, To the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect. So this is where the writer of Hebrews calls it the church of the firstborn. Well, we know that's also referring to Christ as being the firstborn from a life of sin and death with His resurrection. So we know that all three of these examples, the church of God, the church of Christ, the church of the firstborn, it's all really saying the same thing. It's all named after Jesus Christ. So our name as the church and as the body and the bride of Christ is to be named after Christ. So we follow after the church of Christ. 
With this church that, that Jesus instilled, he also gave us an organization. What should the church look like? What should the different offices of the church be? Philippians chapter 1, verse 1, it says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus which are at Philippi, with the bishops and deacons. Here you can see three different roles within this church. So he's talking about the church of Christ. So he says to the saints of Jesus Christ, a saint is a Christian. So anybody who has followed after the word of Christ and they've obeyed him, then they would be called a saint. Then we also have the bishops, and the bishops is also the same word as deacons, which we'll see here in just a second, or the same word as elders, and then we'll see the uh, words deacons. So we've got saints, bishops, and deacons. So these are the different roles that we have. You know, there's a lot of different types of organizations um, that call themselves churches that have different types of offices in that church. There's different things such as priests, nuns, pulpit ministers, worship ministers. There's all these different offices. And what we find in in the organization that we have given to us by Jesus is there's only three offices. And that's a saint, an elder, or a deacon. Everything else is not found in the scripture anywhere. So let's look at those offices a little bit more. First, let's look at elders or, or bishops. Titus chapter 1, verse 5 and 7, it says... For this cause left I thee in Crete, that thou shouldest set in order the things that are wanting, and ordain elders in every city, as I had appointed thee. If any be blameless, the husband of one wife, having faithful children, not accused of riot or unruly, for a bishop must be blameless, as the steward of God, not self-willed, not soon angry, not given to wine, no striker, and not given to filthy lucre. So you can see there in verse 5, it talks about, Titus is supposed to go and ordain elders for the local congregation so that they would have that office. And he also uses in verse 7 the word bishop for a bishop. So you can see that an elder and a bishop can use interchangeably. So when we look at the word elder, the definition of that is an overseer. So that is someone who oversees the flock, spiritually speaking. They're supposed to guide the flock, lead the flock. And that's talked to us about in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 through 3. 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 1, it says, The elders which are among you I exhort, who am also an elder, and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that shall be revealed. Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking oversight thereof, not by constraint, but willingly, not for filthy lucre, but of a ready mind, neither as being lords over the God's heritage, but be examples to the flock. This is where Peter is telling what the elder's role is. The elder's role is to oversee the flock, to oversee the body of saints that's in that congregation that he's a part of, to make sure that they're getting fed spiritually, that they're getting nourished, and that ultimately they're being an example to the flock of how they should be living for Christ. That's the role of an elder, is to shepherd the flock. The other role that we have in the congregation is a deacon. In 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 8, says, Likewise must the deacons be grave, not double-tongued, not given to much wine, not greedy of filthy lucre, holding the mystery of the faith in a pure conscience, and let these also first be proved, then let them use the office of a deacon, being found blameless. Even so must their wives be grave, not slanderers, sober, faithful in all things. Let the deacons be the husbands of one wife, Ruling their, de- ruling their children and their own house as well. For they that have used the office of a deacon well purchase to themselves a good degree and great boldness in the faith which is in Christ Jesus. So here we see the qualifications in order to become a deacon. So if you look up the word deacon in the different uh, dictionaries and concordances, a deacon is a servant, an attendant, and it means to serve or to wait upon. So a deacon's role is to serve the church. When you think about the church, the local congregation, there's a lot of things that has to happen. A lot of people that need service, they need help. And that's really the role of the deacon is to really help fulfill that role. Not to the point where the saints don't help fulfill and serve one another. However, that's one of the primary responsibilities of a deacon is to make sure people are getting taken care of. So the elders make sure people are fed spiritually and they're an example for them of how they should live after Christ. And a deacon should be the ones who serve and help the the body of the saints as well. When we look at this and we see how Christ instituted his church, he made it very clear that there is no human hierarchy. 
when we see the elders and deacons, we can clearly see that both of those roles are roles of service. It's to serve other people. It's not a role of authority or commandment and especially uh, to lead by charge. It's, it is a role of service to help serve the saints in the congregation. In Matthew chapter 20, verse 25, it says, But Jesus called them unto him and said, Ye know that the princes of the Gentiles exercise dominion over them, and they that are great exercise authority upon them. But it shall not be so among you. But whosoever will be great among you, let him be your minister. And whosoever will be chief among you, let him be your servant. Jesus is very clear as he does not like a human hierarchy. We're all on the same play in fear. We, we're all on the same playing field. We just have different roles that we perform within the church. But it is not a role of a hierarchy. So he is saying, whoever is going to be great among you, let him be your servant. So our role is to serve others and to help them as, as we can. Also, we look at Matthew chapter 23 and verse 5. It says, But all their works they do to be seen of men. They make broad their phylacteries and enlarge the borders of their garments and love the uppermost rooms at the feasts and the chief seats in the synagogues and greetings in the markets and to be called of men, Rabbi, Rabbi. But be not ye called Rabbi, for one is your master, even Christ, and one is your father, of, and, but one is your master, which is Christ, <clears throat> and call no man your father upon heaven, for one is your father, which is in heaven. Neither be ye called masters, for one is your master, even Christ. So Jesus is telling us here once again that we should not be doing things to have this special role or to, have, to be looked upon upon men. We should be doing it in order to serve Christ and, and how he sees us. So we've looked at just a few things. We've looked at the unity we have, our standard. We looked at the organization, the church names. So the next thing I want to look at is who is in the church? What comprises the church? Well, the first thing, if you look up, let's look at the word church itself. The word church is the Strong's of G1577 in the New Testament. When you looked up that word, it's ekklesia. And that word ekklesia in the Greek means to be called out. So the church is the group of people who have been called out of the world of sin and into a higher calling. So let's dig deeper into that. So let's look at who is in the church itself. In Acts chapter 2, verse 47, it says, Praising God and having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So in Acts 2.47, it says that the Lord adds us to the church when we're saved. So the, the group of people that's in the church is the group that's saved. It's also the group that's called out of the world of sin would be the one that's saved. One thing to point out here is it says that the Lord is the one who adds to the church. You know, there's different denominations that believe that you have to be voted in to a certain congregation and that the, the group of saints or the group of people there, they have to allow you in order to, to be added to that church. And it's clear from this verse that we don't, as people, have the authority to add people to a church. That is not our role. It's not our right. Only God has that authority. And he adds people to the church when they're saved. So let's look at it even further. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. So the people who are in this church that, that's comprised of it are those that Christ has bought with his own blood. Okay? The next one we're going to look at is the ones that are sanctified. 1 Corinthians 1, verse 2, Paul writes, Unto the church of God, which is at Corinth, to them that are sanctified, in Christ Jesus, called to be saints, with all that in every place call upon the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, both theirs and ours. You know, we don't really use that word sanctified very often, so let's look at what that actually means. Sanctified means to be made pure, to be clean, and to be free from guilt of sin. That's the word sanctified. So Paul is writing to the church at Corinth, and he's saying to the church of God, to them that are sanctified. So those have been made pure, have been made clean, have been made free from sin, are in the church. Those are the people that are comprised of the church. We also have those that are reconciled. Romans chapter 5, verse 10, it says, For if when we were enemies were reconciled to God by the death of His Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by His life. So let's look up that word reconciled too. So to reconcile from a relationship standpoint means to restore to friendship or harmony. 
So you can see how all these are really playing in line. It's the saved, those who were bought with blood, the sanctified, and the reconciled. When you think about your life before you were, were in Christ, that you needed to be reconciled. The relationship you had with God was broken. You didn't have a good relationship with Him. And then when you became into Christ and you were reconciled, you were sanctified, you were made pure and clean, that's when your relationship with Christ and, and God was restored. So that's what Romans chapter 5 is telling us is, is when we're reconciled. So when does this actually happen? At what point does this happen when, we're, when someone is added to the church? Well, that's during baptism. Acts chapter 2, verse 38, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost. So we can see that when we're baptized, the reason that we're baptized is for the remission of sins, so we forgive our sins. So let's think about that a little bit. When we're forgiven of our sins, at that moment is where we're saved. And we just looked at the people who are saved are the people who are put in the church. It's also at the point when Christ's blood cleanses us from our sins. We talked about how the people who are bought with Christ's blood are the people who are in the church. So we can see it checks that box as well. The third thing it says that when we are sanctified, so when we're made pure and clean and free from guilt of sin, that happens when your sins are washed away in baptism. And then the fourth thing we looked at is when we're reconciled, when our relationship is restored with God. That's when our relationship was restored with God because we bury the old man that had a, no relationship with God, and we raise up a new man that has now a clean and pure conscience and, and a new relationship with God. So all of these things happen, and you're added to the church. The Lord adds you to His church when you're baptized, if, if you're baptized for the right reasons. Now, one thing we have to be cautious of is when you're in the church and when you can become a member of the church, you can fall away. There is an opportunity where you could lose that, that privilege of being in God's church. In Acts chapter 20, verse 28, it says, Take heed, therefore, unto yourselves and to all the flock, over the which the Holy Ghost had made you overseers, to feed the church of God, which he hath purchased with his own blood. For I know this, that after my departing shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. Also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things, to draw away disciples after them. Therefore watch, and remember that by the space of three years I cease not to warn you night and day with tears. Paul is writing here and he's saying, be careful. There are some bad people coming and they will draw you away. And he's telling us the same thing for us today is that we have to be careful because false prophets can come, deceivers can come, and they can pull you out. So there is an opportunity where we could fall away from the church. So we have to be watching out for that. Now, this falling away can come from a couple different things. So the first thing is, is it can come from specific errors. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 1, it says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly, that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from each, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving, and them which believe and know the truth. So the Spirit clearly speaks that falling away would come from bringing these specific errors. And we can see these errors in many religious movements today that we have to be cautious of them. We have to be careful that, remember, our standard is God's Word. And that's the standard that we follow, not anything that, that men teaches that's in contradiction of God's Word. The other way that, that someone could fall away is to not have any tolerance for the truth. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2, Paul's telling Timothy, he says, Preach the word. Be instant in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all longsuffering and doctrine. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. You know, Paul is writing to Timothy, and he's telling him, go preach the word, go stand upon it when it's convenient for you, when it's not convenient for you, keep going. Because there's going to be a time that people don't follow after that. But one thing that we always need to remember is sometimes we could be those people that don't follow after the truth. We could be those who have been turned unto fables if we're not careful. So we have to watch out. We have to make sure what we believe is in strict accordance and in alignment with God's word and what he wants us to do. So we have to watch out for that. 
Now, at the same time that we can fall away from the truth, and we need to know that that is a possibility, we also need a reminder that we have a great security that nothing external other than ourselves could pull us from the love of God. In Romans chapter 8, verse 38, it says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. You know, we can look out in the world today and, and we can say like how evil it is or how hard things are getting, or we can look at you know, different political agendas and say how hard it's going to be for us to really follow after God the way He wants us to. But one thing that we can always remember is that there's nothing that can pull us from the love of God. God is greater than all that. We have to be careful that we don't allow ourselves to turn away from God, and we don't walk away from Him, but He will never leave us and He'll never forsake us, no matter how hard it gets. We can always follow after Him. So there's a great security when you're a member of the church, when you're a member of His body and His bride, He'll never leave you, he'll, and He's never going to forsake you. So let's recap what we've learned so far. So Christ built one church. It's one body and it's one bride, and that is the universal body of Christians, regardless of your physical location all across the world. And in that church, he desires unity. He desires that we would have one standard, and that standard is God's word, and that we would follow after it. The church is named after him. It's named after Christ. He set up the organization for the local congregations, which includes elders, deacons, and saints. The saved are those that are added to his church, and we always have to be aware that we don't fall away. So this morning, I've hoped you learned a little bit more about the church that, and what Christ has actually built. It's not a man-made organization. It's not anything that we put together. It's just different things that Christ has set in place for us, and it's up to us to follow after him. And if you're not a member of his church, then it's unfortunate that you don't have the blessings that it, it has to be a child of God. But you can have that this morning. We just looked at how you become a member of that church, and when you're added is, is when, when you're baptized, and when you wash away your sins. It's when you're reconciled with Him, you're forgiven of your sins, you're made a new person. And if you'd like to become a member of that church this morning, we can help you so that you can be a brother and sister of, as a, of ours, and we would love nothing more. If you are a member of the church, then you have a responsibility. Your responsibility is to grow the church. Go share it with other people. Go let them know the benefits and the blessings that you have of being a child of God and that they can have it as well. Go show them how they can become a member of the church and how they can receive all those blessings just as you receive. If you'd like to become a member of the church or you need the prayers or the assistance of the church for any reason, anything at all this morning, all you have to do is come have a seat on the front pew while we stand and sing the song that's been selected. We hope you enjoyed this teaching from God's Word. If there's anything we can do to help you in your walk with Christ, send us a message at facebook.com slash cfcnwa. To find more sermons, look for us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Spotify, and like our Facebook page. Thanks for listening, and God bless.